Hello and welcome to Introduction to Asian American Communities, uh, Intro to Asian American History. Uh, today we'll talk about the first uh, unit of this uh, particular lecture where we're going to cover um, the theoretical concepts that are present within Shelley Lee's book, the, the textbook that we're going to be using for the remainder of this, uh, of this class. And in order for us to do this, we're going to have to understand this concept called Orientalism. Well, what is Orientalism? Well, Orientalism is a book by Edward Said. Uh, it was written um, in the 1970s, although there are different um, updated editions to this book. Um, and um, it's a critique on Western historical, cultural, and political perceptions of the East. And this book will help us sort of get a better understanding of the concept of how the West has and continues to uh, project its own conception of the East and how that is uh, uh, an issue of, of power and how we can recontextualize and reimagine uh, the history of how Asians and Asian Americans are portrayed in the United States. Uh, so this will help us understand how the Asian American is constructed in society today. Uh, this theoretical framework draws on Gramsci's theory of hegemony and Foucault's theory of power. These theorists lay the groundwork for Said's uh, Orientalism. And this is from Said's work where it says, quote, Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and most of the time and the Occident, right? And the Occident being the West. So there's this um, sort of contrasting discourse that is being presented through what the Orient presents of uh, how the Orient is presented through this lens of the West. So Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring and having authority over the Orient. So Orientalism and how it is defining Asians is really important to us to understand how the United States is also part of an Orientalist practice, which we'll get into later on in this lecture. While the particular idea of what con constitutes the Orient and Occidental have shifted, uh, Western superiority is always superior uh, simultaneously with a fascination with and revulsion of the East. And I think this is a really poignant quote that Lee uh, presents to us where the West is always looked upon in this sort of uh, lens of superiority. So what this does is this thinking adds to the Western and white identity, which also helps to rationalize polit uh, political, economic, and military domination and interventions over the weak Asian powers. It's a way in which uh, the white identity, Western identity is constructed through an othering practice that uh, shows Asia as weaker than uh, the West, you know, particularly Asia, particularly the Middle East, which is where Orientalism is, is sort of defined through the lens of, of Said, right? Uh, because the Orient's position as Europe's most recurrent other stems from its position as the site of Europe's greatest and richest uh, uh, colonies. Right? Asia is romanticized as being romantic, exotic. Right? It's looked at as being terrifying and disgusting, but otherworldliness is always a common dynamic in uh, this practice of um, Orientalism that happens within you know, these sort of academic fields, scholarly works that bring back um, uh, this sort of um, knowledge of what their perception of Asia is and how it is reconstructed in a way that others, the Asia, uh, Asian countries, Asian regions like that aren't uh, necessarily, uh, that aren't necessarily European. Right, this is uh, constructed and made for Europe's identity. So it's really constructed through how Europe is uh, 
uh, is supposed to be perceived and how it kind of galvanizes and, and sort of uh, builds a, a stronger sort of identity uh, in some cases for uh, almost like nationalistic uh, views. And this is where we'll see how American Orientalism uh, really operates too, with partic in particular with how Asia and Asians are uh, sort of socially constructed. And this sort of happens and this sort of stems from early Western and medieval writers, right? Writing uh, about their travels to Asia, right? So there are these folks like, um, you know, Marco Polo, right? These folks that are traveling to Asia, you know, maybe they're traders that are writing in their journals um, and, and, and they are experiencing this exotic new world, right? This exotic food, these precious stones and, and, and sort of this jewelry, but in their writing, is also this uh, perception of how the people are described as uh, sort of less than human, right? Um, and they're looked at as being animalistic and right? having these sort of anim animalistic characteristics. So women with boar's tusks and hair down to their heels and oxen's tails growing out of their loins. They're 13 feet tall and their bodies have the whiteness of marble and have camel's feet and donkey's teeth, right? So this perception of this sort of exaggerated uh, view of how uh, women were, were being portrayed uh, in Asia um, is another way of sort of putting, you know, uh, the people in Europe on a, on a higher plane, you know, uh, like these, uh, these Asians are, are sort of uh, inhuman, non-human, right? And, and so their existence in and of itself is less than what we do in Europe, right? And for Orientalism in particular, religious differences played a key uh, component to um, how um, uh, this is framed, particularly with um, discourse that is framed within a, a lens of Christianity. Right, and, and particularly with missions and, and so, some of the, the writings of how right, non-Christians are being portrayed with, um, uh, in contrast to Christianity, right? So Christians versus non-Christians and specifically Muslim. And this is where Saeed sort of uh, uh, point comes across, especially um, with his um, understanding of being uh, seeing and experiencing what it's like to be uh, Muslim and in, 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 um, particular in, in the West. Um, and you see these depictions of um, Muslims as being heathens, you know, in some of these classic writings too, which is again, uh, you know, reifying this, this sort of um, uh, the strength and, and sort of Europe's identity, the West's identity through um, uh, uh, putting down or pushing down uh, the um, uh, the sort of non-Western uh, ideologies, right? There's a connection here between power and ideology. Right? The Orient never and, and had a, a voice of its own, but rather was written by the West. And this is what we see throughout history. So it enthralls and elevates the Western uh, consumer with tales and objects from strange and faraway places, right? So again, it's not only this, this sort of, um, uh, you know, this sort of um, understanding of how uh, the West uh, views, right, uh, the East, but rather how the West consumes the East as a result and, and how that um, this othering practice is, is sort of um, again shown uh, time and time again through these orientalist practices of um, you know of the strange and exotic and faraway places that um, sort of the west has explored and bringing back these um, these these sort of items that can be uh, sort of used to barter or to sell um, which was also looked upon as as a, as a lucrative sort of operation that they could easily sort of operate within because um, the the west had a stronger grasp of of how um, uh, mercantilism you know or you know which is pre uh, capitalism can really uh, play into this um, understanding of how we view um, um, uh, how the West views Orient, the Orient. 
So speaking uh, to the ideology and power, uh, the long tradition of the Orient legitimized Western ambitions to dominate and appropriate Asia, right? And domination administratively, economically, and militarily, right? There's this domination that happens through um, this ideology, right? Through power, right? Um, and you see this, uh, you know, even in a contemporary context when we're looking at media portrayals of maybe traveling to uh, Asia through commercials that we see, or um, you know, uh, going to an exotic land uh, like um, Japan or maybe Thailand or something like that. That is that is um, exoticized and romanticized due to the fact that it's it's sort of has this um, uh, because like de dehumanized sort of. Uh, perception, and that, that still continues on today, right? And, and this um, started with the uh, per Portugal's uh, penetration into India, Southeast Asia, and Macau in the 1600, uh, 16th century, uh, and, and it drew on a power derived from a long tradition, uh, but also the power of common sense, right? So like something like uh, observations, like why do these people um, these people, as these people in the Orient, you know, eat with their hands versus people in the um, West who eat with forks and knives, right? This is common sense, right? And this, this goes to show how common sense notions or what we in the West or uh, the, the West perceives as common sense is, is really not common sense um, to someone in, in Asia and how uh, that is viewed as um, something that is less than. Right, um, it is a really uh, powerful uh, understanding. Right, it, it's more than just um, simple ethnocentrism. Right, where you know maybe an individual sees this uh, and tries to almost. I feel like ethnocentrism has like an individualistic uh, conception behind it, uh, but rather this becomes sort of um, reified within uh, you know, academic and scholarly works where it, it influences not just uh, the individual, but you are then influencing people who cannot access these sort of, um, uh, right, the, the travel to these exotic lands, uh, i.e. in Asia, and therefore their own perceptions are again, sort of portrayed through uh, this lens of the, uh, what the, the sort of Western explorer has has seen and what, what they feel, right? So the Orient was viewed as being backward because it was, and people have been saying that for a long time, right? It wasn't just, it wasn't something that is, is sort of based on truth, but rather is based on a social construct. It was built, right? It was built as being backward, right? And, and this is how ideology and sort of these, uh, what we deem as common sense is, is really viewed as, as through this sort of lens of, uh, of how it influences how we can then reshape and, and sort of build upon this othering practice by building up, um, you know, Europe as the better of the, the sort of the, the two dichotomies that we see. So no one visited the Orient or encountered an Oriental therefore relied on text from someone else. You know, this is what I spoke on earlier with, with regards to how the Orient and, and the Oriental was, um, was portrayed, okay? The Orient was also viewed as one dimensional, right? And, th and this plays on, you know, what we would see as individuals, you know, maybe in terms of stereotypes that we would see, uh, you would only uh, understand the, the quote unquote Orient through this one dimensional sort of um, perspective, you know, very, um, you know, uh, male chauvinistic uh, perspective, male dominant perspective. Uh, so you're not really getting a, a good sense of what the what a particular culture is, but rather on these sort of assumptions and, and the assumptions of what we deem as common sense is also viewed um, uh, as uh, uh, what we in the West would traditionally view as, as being common sense is, is completely um, uh, looked down upon when these practices are not practiced in the, um, in the, in the East. So there, there are several bullet points here when we're talking about Orientalism in America. Um, and, you know, what event was the catalyst that started Orientalism in America, right? So we see this happening um, in, um, in Europe, 
right? And so the main crux of Said's argument is we see this in like European sort of knowledge production, uh, European understandings of um, religion, right? How Christianity sort of, uh, you know, became this sort of dominant force with the use of sort of ideology and, and power. And what we're seeing here is this taking uh, shape in the United States or in America as well, um, or the American territories, right? Because we really see this happening in, in 1492 uh, when Christopher Columbus uh, sailed to uh, to discover, quote unquote, this new world. Um, uh, you know, and, and there are similarities and there are parallels to what we see with how he views the, the world with Marco Polo. Um, and he was looking for a route to Asia. You know, and I think that that's where we get the term Indians. So I think it's really important for us to understand that this whole notion of Orientalism is sort of rooted, or this whole notion of sort of the quote unquote discovery of America is rooted in uh, this notion of discovering or, or sort of finding a way to, to sort of bridge the uh, bridge sort of trade routes to, to the Orient. So you could sort of, um, uh, you know, extract the resources um, and, and bring them back to uh, in, uh, that Asia has to offer, particularly when you're talking about the, the, the tea trade um, and, um, and some of the sort of um, the, these, these exotic items that, that um, only are available in Asia, which many Europeans wanted uh, to, to have control of. Um, so that, that's one example, right, where he called the, the, the Indians, right, uh, Native Americans Indians. Um, and, and also we can look at how the American Revolution was an Anglo-American identity, right, as well, especially when we're looking at um, the, how the British, right, were uh, symbolic in terms of like, uh, you know, sort of distant uh, America, quote unquote, the United States or America's distancing of themselves away from uh, the, the, this European notion of, of colonialism, et cetera. And what we see here is um, as a result of the, the American sort of revolution happening, America sort of creating its own identity, this notion of sort of, um, you know, wanting to establish, um, you know, one's own, uh, you know, strengths, right, as a new nation, right, uh, and nation building is um, you see how, you um, you know, there is also this view that um, is very much an American uh, perspective on how they view uh, the Orient and the Occident, right? Um, and so it kind of uh, creates its own um, sort of understanding of what even America's understanding of what Orientalism is. And this is what we kind of see with the, the American Revolution. When we recontextualize it through this sort of Orientalist um, of lens, I mean, we're talking the Boston Tea Party, um, you know, and it, wasn't, it was a prime example because you have the, the, the Boston Tea Party was a protest against British tax policy, but also for the desire for fair trade and unfettered access to Chinese goods, right? Um, and so you see this sort of, um, almost um, understanding of how, uh, you know, the Americans were trying to divorce themselves from the sort of European control, right, that was happening through uh, this sort of uh, understanding of wanting to get closer to, to Asia, right, and this is the, the big sort of crux of what uh, the value was that, that the Americas brought to the table was not only this, this sort of quote unquote new land, but was also this access to being able to access uh, Chinese goods. So obviously wanting open trade, um, uh, you know, uh, through material objects and, and having to uh, Chinese sort of culture, Chinese writings as well, was a real sort of draw to why America was deemed as this sort of important uh, uh, sort of, um, sort of entry point for Europe to get access to um, Asian goods. Okay, and, and you see this in some of the earlier writings in the 1700s, American writings uh, that describe the places, you know, and, and resources that the Pacific has to offer. Um, you know, it plays into, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, into this notion of manifest destiny and descriptions of, of trade with the Chinese where, where you know, uh, Chinese had, uh, were also affixed to sort of Amer the American fur trade, right? And this is, you know, um, uh, you know, this is where sort of mercantilism was really at, at its height um, with, with the United States. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and so you saw these sort of um, 
international exchanges that were happening, um, you know, in the 1700s um, with sort of the Chinese and and with sort of um, the U.S. You know, in particular, again, U.S. sort of establishing its own uh, Orientalist um, sort of uh, and sort of. Uh, you know, its own uh, mark uh, in terms of sort of international uh, foreign policy and, and trade as well. So international trade and foreign policy, okay? So, uh, but, you know, America was, was not as successful as, as they had wished. Um, and this is true when trade did not favor the U.S. tradesmen, uh, uh, where there was superior claims of, of free trade, um, you know, and, and this, you know, kind of um, sort of rift between maybe um, the United States and China really sort of became the start of what we kind of see with sort of this racialization um, that was uh, that was kind of um, shared from how the Chinese viewed the Europeans. That makes sense. So it was rooted in the Chinese's um, perception of Occidentalism, right? It was shared with European traders and, and Asian ports, right? And so um, again, you know, so there are this, uh, there are these sort of perceptions that I think we have to understand of how, um, right? Asia also had its own perceptions of what the West was like too, and how. Uh, you know, the Chinese also had their own perspectives and views of how um, the Occident um, was, uh, or the West is, is being framed through European, you know, through their own lenses and their own sort of ethnocentric and racialized perceptions too. Um, and so, um, you know, there was this sort of, you know, back and forth of, of, of um, uh, you know, um, sort of showing um, and, and the, the U.S., you know, and in, in, in these sort of early um, publications of how the Chinese were actually a, a submissive and cowardly sort of group of people. Uh, they had bizarre foods, bizarre practices, odd music, etc. Um, again, playing on the fact that the U.S. really wasn't getting its way when they were first establishing themselves as a, a true um, sort of uh, power on the international stage. So they, 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 they gambled, uh, they were superstitious, they as in the Chinese. And this is where we get this sort of notion of they were this, the, these lowly tricksters and, and they were viewed in, in these particular sort of stereotypes where, where they were developed because of, um, again, um, what we see uh, you know, with the tradition of Orientalism in, in Europe, also uh, having strong sort of uh, having uh, translated fairly well in this establishment of, of U.S. domination and power, right? They were using these sort of same techniques in order to other, okay? Right, so the, there was a reinforcement of these dehumanizing views with immigration in the U.S. Okay. So what we see is this American Orientalist, right? People in the U.S. developed their own understanding of Asia, right, in the U.S., uh, and it was used to, to the East to wrestle with and, and clarify issues of national identity, right, and this is, a, you know, this is an important concept, I think, is the why it's important that we use this Orientalist framework, because it's this notion of, uh, right, dominating and, and domination, right, through, through power, but it's through not just, you um, uh, you know, economic sort of strength, right? But how economic strength and how militaristic strength is developed is also through some of these more um, uh, traditional sort of scholarly works um, and also sort of uh, anti, you know, where we see this birth of like anti Asianness and anti Asian um, political rhetoric um, and social rhetoric that was happening uh, in order to, um, again, affirm America's identity, America's national identity. Right. So you see these writings about Asia, it was romanticized, but, it's, but also conveyed repulsion and disdain. Okay. Um, and, and this included China, but also expanded in India where Americans had 
have very mixed feelings. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it wasn't just like China versus the US, but it was also this practice that we saw with other Asian countries. Um, we'll see this happening time and time and again, where, where um, you know, Asian countries almost serve as a proxy to this notion of Americans uh, wanting to, to sort of um, uh, continue to, to galvanize and, and build upon their, their own sort of significance on the world stage. Okay, so uh, Indian culture, uh, um, you know, again, is, is gonna come up uh, as well. Um, and um, how we, uh, how the Western, uh, Western writers viewed, um, uh, you know, was viewed through uh, Indian culture as well, um, you know, and how, uh, you know, there, there's also sort of a, a reverse sort of romanticization that's happening with um, this sort of um, America's sort of um, um, infiltration of, of their own sort of ideologies, right? Um, and so it does have this sort of double-edged sword where it influences both, um, they're trying to also uh, project their influence, which is also, um, uh, you know, allowing people to sort of realize, um, uh, you know, these sort of American values and contrasting them with their own values, like the caste and, and, and sort of what the free world, or at least the what is deemed as the free world um, here in the United States, um, although there are many contradictions to what American freedom is really um, uh, looked upon as. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, again, we see this um, fetishization of Asia and Asians um, and Asian culture um, that, that does increase with um, sort of the establishment of uh, sort of American domination, American power and, and trade in the 18th, in the 18th century. So this is a great video that I think helps uh, sort of captivate what the coolie trade was. Um, so um, I, uh, this is um, something that I won't show now, but I think it'll be a really great uh, video to watch, um, um, you know, after as a supplemental um, piece. So I highly recommend just getting a better understanding of what a uh, coolie is, as opposed to what slavery is and what freedom is too. Um, and in a general sense, you know, a coolie is referred to as uh, someone who's imported, uh, it's, it's imported Asian labor uh, that is mostly from China and, and South Asia. And you see demand increase, especially when slave labor was banned in Britain and other colonies. What you see is 500,000 Chinese and South Asian men were shipped to Cuba, Peru, Brazil, Jamaica. You saw a lot of this uh, sort of um, these, um, uh, these quote unquote coolies, which is now viewed more as a derogatory term. Um, so I don't like using it too much, but it's based on this voluntary contract and legal rights, uh, you know, and, and this is somehow supposed to be more of a, you know, a, a more egalitarian, more equal in terms of an exchange of, of labor, right? And when we're seeing um, this notion of, you know, one being paid for their services, what we see in sort of these early uh, uh, sort of iterations of what, what we deem capitalism today. And um, basically what happened was they were tricking, uh, you know, these, these traders, these ships, uh, these, um, you know, these, these captains um, of these sort of uh, trade, uh, trade ships were uh, tricking coolies into these fixed wages and they forced them into basically, um, you know, what, what one would deem as something that is very close to slave labor, okay. Um, and, you know, the, the shipping of coolies was eventually outlawed, uh, but, you know, what, what deemed a coolie was very unclear. Um, and so you see this sort of practice happening more, I think, uh, less officially, um, obviously, with um, these sort of contracts, is contracts never being fulfilled, um, et cetera, right? Wh whether they were actually hired workers or, or contractors, uh, or and it's um, sort of this gray area that many of these um, early Chinese and, and South Asian men found themselves here on, in, in the, in, in the sort of the Caribbean, South America, um, and, and we see how um, even the early settlers uh, of what we deem like the United States were, were from, you know, South, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, particularly with like the Filipino uh, community who, who actually were the first um, Asian 
um, Asians to settle the United States and, and New Orleans. So you have Chinese migrants, um, um, you know, having to prove um, that they were sort of free and, and sort of um, on their sort of, um, uh, you know, arriving under their own will, right? Um, and, and with regards to the Chinese, you know, this is different than the Chinese, but uh, helped uh, usher in uh, sort of uh, uh, black and white free immigrants too. And so as we move forward to sort of um, US, um, as, as Lee moves us forward, right, we see how manifest destiny uh, across the, uh, uh, the continent and the Pacific really uh, has impacted um, this notion of American sort of expansion um, through this, another concept that we talk about with is, which is uh, manifest destiny or God's will, okay? Not, not God's, God's plan, right? So it's not, God's plan, sorry, Drake, um, but it's God's will, right? And the Western frontier, all of North America and the lands of Mexico, right? Yes, uh, this is God's will, is ours for the taking, right? And these are some, you know, this is our understanding of how the West, right? The Western frontier um, was, was occupied, you know, through this notion of um, manifest destiny. Um, so not only do you have all this sort of, um, uh, Orientalism sort of coming to fruition, um, but then you also have sort of America's westward expansion and sort of manifest destiny that's also coupled with um, this, this idea of um, controlling um, the land for uh, and appropriating it for, um, for um, the, the settlement. Um, and so what we see is um, it was an additional chapter in America's Orientalism and, and Manifest Destiny is what we see with this westward expansion. Um, and mainly for this expansion, what we're looking at is also expansion to uh, open up trade with Japan. So not only do you see, you know, this sort of notion of, you know, we have to, you know, build right, the United States, you know, we have to move to the West, but the reason was so that we could sort of expand and open trade with Asia, with Japan, you know, in particular, right, America had its sights on sort of, um, you know, uh, developing these international uh, relations, whether they were, you know, political or, or trade relations that were heavily, um, uh, you know, determined on this notion of expanding the continent expand, or expanding into the continent of America, uh, especially with the US. And this is why it was really important for the American, uh, for American um, sort of uh, settler colonialism um, to sort of move um, into um, the, the sort of uh, the areas that we deem the West Coast today was to sort of expand trade in, into sort of China, into Asia, right? Opening up these trade routes that would uh, right, uh, exponentially help uh, the, the economy and, and grow and, and sort of develop the U.S. as uh, the superpower that it deemed itself and that it is today, right? And even though, right, um, this notion of expanding to Asia, you know, maybe to Japan, to, to China, et cetera, uh, you also saw how, again, with the sort of notion of, well, uh, of sort of um, backwardness was also portrayed um, when, when, you know, Japan was a closed off, you know, country and the United States was, you know, always about sort of opening trade routes and how that was also deemed as something as uh, backward is also an important, um, point to understanding how, um, again, this notion of being backwards, this notion of being um, less than was um, sort of inculcated onto the human uh, experience of, of being a quote unquote an American, right? Of, of, of uh, building oneself up through putting down other cultures, other countries. So you have views of Japan were different from the Chinese. Um, and, and yet, you know, they were kind of considered both as, you know, one and the same almost and lumped together, just these backwards Asian countries that America needed to um, sort of help influence. And, and we see this happening, I think, um, with even how the Native American indigenous communities were, were pushed out um, when we see this happening with sort of how uh, this um, um, relationship between Mexico and the U.S. Uh, sort of 
uh, came to fruition as well. And it's just a sort of, uh, it's just, it just tacks on to this sort of, uh, uh, this sort of American uh, settler colonial sort of um, um, ideologies of, of moving forward just and basically taking uh, or what they considered moving forward and, and sort of taking for what they considered should be open to everyone. Right. And, and if they're not willing to do that, they're now they're backwards, they're, they're, they're lowly and we have to do something about that. We as in the U.S. has to do something about that. Okay. Um, and so in 1853, you see um, Commodore Matt Perry, who arrived in Japan uh, with warships, and, and he kind of forced sort of Japan to, to open up uh, uh, trade um, to in, in the 1850s. And this is a very, um, you know, well-known um, historical context that is always, um, uh, you know, presented, you know, in a way of like this great accomplishment that Matthew Perry had um, sort of been able to, to do, but this is again, part of that uh, uh, sort of uh, settler colonial American expansionist white, uh, white supremacist even to a degree and, and manifest destiny, right? It was all uh, part of this uh, American project that I think um, is a connection that um, sort of that uh, Shelley Lee is making through um, Orientalism, okay? And so you see Americans sort of taking credit for um, this uh, awakening of Japan. Japan's modernization was due in fact because of, not because uh, Japan sort of uh, kind of was like, okay, fine, we'll let y'all come in, but it was a matter of, of, of sort of Matthew Perry being very strong in, in his uh, uh, way of like being able to somehow uh, negotiate with this sort of backward country, right? To, to finally being awoke uh, uh, awakening to, to sort of uh, the modern world, right? And again, it increased this notion of not only um, sort of Orientalism, but also how the West not only can um, uh, open up, you know, the, the, the East, but also can civilize the East as well. It's not just about backwardsness anymore. It's about, you know, um, sort of, sharing Western knowledge and Western influences because that was deemed as the, the more sort of superior, right? Uh, uh, way of, you know, uh, uh, you know of, of interacting um, with the rest of the world, right? Well, there's, there's only this one sort of great American way of like free trade and all that stuff. And we see these similar actions taking place in Korea and the Philippines. And, uh, you know, we see how, um, you know, this happened, you know, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about the Spanish-American War um, and with the Philippines and, and obviously the Korean War and, and what we've uh, sort of seen uh, through the history of, you know, sort of contrasting sort of Japanese expansion and ja Japanese sort of imperialism as well. Uh, and then we see uh, America uh, reflected on uh, and defined the substance and boundaries of uh, American uh, civic identity. And it's not this Matthew Perry. I thought this was kind of funny, but it's not the, the guy from Friends. So again, sort of put a big uh, X mark over this. This is not Commodore Matthew Perry, although they have the same name. Um, I thought that was a little bit of a you know, pun, a little funny thing that I thought was interesting. Um, so thanks for humoring, humoring me on that one. Okay, um, and so that concludes this lecture. Um, again, I think it's just really important to understand how what we're looking at, um, uh, you know, how um, Orientalism is establishing um, our a, 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 a better understanding of um, how it, it all relates to um, this this way in which America um, sort of defined itself through the othering practice of, of Asia, I think it becomes more prevalent how right, these other projects are also sort of uh, tied in together too. You're looking at um, you know, indigenous folks um, dealing with the same situation. Um, you see how slavery gets, gets sort of tied into all of this as well with the transatlantic slave trade and, and the coolie trade um, and how um, these histories are really tied into this greater American project that um, uh, as we'll see in the, in the coming weeks is, is very um, uh, troubling, problematic, 
but it's also a bit, uh, it also allows us an inquiry into a better understanding of how uh, the U.S. is um, uh, the, the history of the United States and, and seeing how um, there um, how it's not what it seems or what it has seemed to be in terms of this understanding of like freedom and, and democracy and what we're kind of being sort of taught and inculcated in our sort of K-12 education. Um, so that um, concludes this particular lecture. Um, feel free to reach out to me with any questions or concerns. And um, uh, I look forward to um, expanding on some of these concepts as we move through uh, the, the lectures.